Hello and welcome to Breaking Geek Radio, the podcast, the premier podcast of LRM Online. I'm your host, Brandon Jones, and this week I've got a special treat for you guys. So this is not in lieu of the regular show. We're still going to have that uh, with Jammer and Nick and Danny this week. But in addition to that, I've got you know a short wave for you guys. And I know in common parlance, a short wave is actually something that goes over longer distances, but let's let's visualize it as it actually sounds. So this is going to just be a shorter version. And in this show, I had an opportunity to sit down with the stars of Lovecraft Country from HBO, and I was invited to go and sit at this round table by the African American Film Critics Association. It was a really good time. I got to talk to Jonathan Majors and Journey Smollett and Michael K. Williams, Wumi Musaka, uh, Anjanu Ellis, and Abby Lee. Everybody was really gracious. Uh, everybody, I got to ask everyone at least one question, and it was a fun time. So I, I've, tr- I've put that in like a podcast form as best I could, like the one question thing bouncing between them. Um, it's going to sound a little weird, so forgive me for that, I, I, but I thought the content would be worth it for you guys to take a listen to. So enjoy, and I'll be back with you after the break. What's that book you've been reading about? It's about heroes who get to go on adventures, defeat the monsters, and save the day. Those boys from the south side of Chicago are the only tourists that get to do that. This story is about my father and the secret birthright that's been kept from us. You're going after it. We're going to need a car. He's not standing there, Jay. This is family business. And family stay together. Bad for my own, scared for myself. Just because they don't want you here doesn't mean you're not supposed to be. Gotta get away. This is an invitation to unmitigated power. Where in the hell did I go wrong with you, Roy? I told you to stay away from that damn place. There's something here. Just trying to get out. Everything is where and as it should be. From God to man. Sorry, I'm, I missed the whole Zoom apocalypse thing. So I'm the muting, unmuting. I'm I'm bad at it. I apologize. Yeah, please, brother. Jonathan, how are you doing? All right, man. I'm all right. So my name is Brandon Jones. I'm from LRM Online. Uh, the question I had for you is of the situations and experiences that that Tick finds himself on the show. What are the ones that you, Jonathan, would personally find yourself the most afraid of? Whew, um, the most afraid of, um, you know, I would, I would say off top, I can go with the moment where Atticus attacks his father, you know, um, I think that's a very scary thing because, uh, for me personally, the amount of hurt and the amount of, uh, just discomfort and rage that is, uh, you know, that, that I battle with as an individual, you know what I'm saying, in regards to uh, a paternal figure, you know, to my uh, biological father. That moment, it's, uh, he's completely unleashed, you know, and there's a spirit moving through him, you know. He's possessed, you know, it's not like we did in episode three where he was actually possessed, but something has taken over him, you know, and I think he is out of control there, you know, and, and he says later on, you know, lady asked, uh, would you have killed him? And he said, I, I've thought about it, you know, so to really put yourself in that position is, is terrifying. And then uh, uh, secondarily, I would say, you know, to fall in love with a woman, you know, I'm thinking about episode six now, to fall in love with a woman. And I, that's ter- that would be terrifying for me, you know. Uh, it is terrifying, you know, to fall in love with a woman and then to uh, uh, lose her in that in that way, you know what I'm saying? To not know what the fuck just happened, you know? Um, and it's his first time, you know, in many ways, not just to physically express love, but to also um, emotionally and spiritually, you know, uh, experience it, you know? And for that to be a uh, damnable experience, 
Uh, quite terrifying. Hi, Journey. How are you? I'm well. How are you, Brandon? I'm doing all right. Thank you. So I'm here from LRM Online, and the question I had for you was, what experience, if any, did you have with H.P. Lovecraft and his work prior to joining the show? I gotta be honest, you know, prior to Nisha talking about doing Lovecraft Country and like, I remember her talking about the pitching process and stuff like that. I didn't have much experience with Lovecraft. I mean, I was aware of him as being, you know, one of the fathers of terror, um, but it wasn't until she sent me the script to read now, mind you, she didn't offer it to me at first, but she sent it to me to read as like a friend here, this is what I'm working on. And then I became obsessed with landing the role that I then went and read the book um, that Matt Ruff wrote before she even cast me. Then um, started like digging more into Lovecraft and, you know, it's unfortunate that you, when you, when you dig deeper, <laughs> into some of these quote unquote greats of the past, you know, you, you discover a lot of things you wish you hadn't discovered, right? You discover the truth, the whole truth about them, um, which the book uh, very beautifully touches upon and the show dives into even deeper um, in that he had a very dark side of him, a very racist side of him, you know, um, and it's just, um, you know, it's it's something you cannot separate from him. It makes you, once you know, you can't unknow. And once you go back, you're like, oh wait, these monsters he's seeing are actually not just monsters. They're like, this is, these are people, or these are, he's, you know, his own fears of the unknown, his own ignorance of other cultures comes into play in his work. Yeah, so that was the extent to which I knew his work. Um, but I've since gone and done a deeper dive while shooting the show. Go ahead and hopefully Abby will be able to hear you. All right. Hi, Abby. How are you, you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. So thanks for being with us. Uh, I'm from LRM Online. My question for you is, so Christina and Ruby are kind of on these parallel journeys, uh, one transforming from a black woman into a white woman and, and her experiencing what it's like to be seen and be heard. What does it mean for Christina to change from being a woman to a man? Like what is, what is her journey and what does that mean for her? Okay, that, that was broken up, but I heard woman, man, journey. So I, I think I get the gist of what you're asking me, sorry. Um, I think that uh, that Christina's main goal journey in life is to emancipate herself from the patriarchal society that she's been brought up under. And that is um, that she is just trying to get ahead and get, um, get even with and get um, as powerful as the man who um, raised her. Um, I mean, she has a very complicated relationship with her father, which informs a lot of what. And Christina doesn't want to be a man. Um, Chris, Christina is very happy being a woman. She just wants to have access to what men have access to. And so. Christina's journey isn't about becoming a man. It's just about trying to get equal. So she's not a, um, clearly, she's not a politician, you know, she's not, um, she's not a civil rights activist, you know, but she, she wants to prove that, that, that women can do what men can do. And she wants to get back at her father. And I think she essentially also wants to be accepted by her father, even though she kills him. Um, I think that she's, I think that, that in a, even that act is an act to try and get closer to him, to be like, see, I got you. And now you might love me because she could never get him to love her the way that she needed to be loved. And maybe 
he'll love her now because she did the biggest thing she could have done. You know, she made a huge sacrifice to prove that she was stronger than him. Um, so I think her journey is a lot about reconnecting with that that lost that lost child who was who was neglected. Um, but I also think there is a, there is a there's a derangement in Christina where like her power her hunger for like her hunger for power has become so toxic and so delusional that I'm not even really sure she understands what she wants at the end of the day. I, th I think that like her end goal has become so obscene that she's a little bit sidetracked right now. Mike, good morning. Morning. So first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to you this morning. Uh, my name Thank is Brandon you. Jones. I'm from LRM Online. I wanted to build on a question I asked Jonathan. I asked him uh, what made him afraid. And so I kind of posed the same question to you because his answer was interesting. He said that it was the fight that he had with Montrose. That was the thing that would have scared him personally. So the question I have for you is the same one. Of the experiences that Montrose has had on the show or any of the characters have had on the show, uh, what would be the one that made you the most afraid, Michael K. Williams? That made me most afraid. I think it would still have to be episode nine. Um, you know, watching uh, Ancho's time travel and, and go back home to relive his trauma, you know, um, it made me do that in a, you know, in a, in its own way. It took me back home and to my past. Um, and it was, it was a, it's creepy. I actually remember seeing like family members that of my own in that scene. I was so close to the fire. Uh, Montrose had me so close to the fire uh, in episode nine, and it was frightening. You, you know, it was. Uh, yeah, I guess it would be episode nine. It was when, when you know, going home with Montrose. It took me home in a sense of. Yeah. Hi, Wimmy. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thank you. So I'm Brandon Jones. I'm from LRM Online. Um, my question for you is the transformation that Ruby has into Hillary and the one that Christina has into uh, William, it's very violent. It, it seems violent. And so I was curious, is that, a, is that a deliberate choice? Is that meant to be portrayed as violent? Can you talk about that choice as to why? I mean, I think it's, I, I have no idea why they chose to do it like that, but it's, but I don't know that it makes sense. And the fact that she says it's like being unmade, it, it just makes sense that it's, I feel like it's quite symbolic. Like the, the I, I don't know, I don't know how to kind of describe it, but it feels symbolic, especially like, oh you don't see it and you haven't seen it yet you haven't seen the transition to her being white you see her come becoming a black woman and it's visceral and it's painful and it's like it's gory i i just feel like it's quite symbolic of like you know being a black woman in in the world yeah i don't i think there is a logic that I can't I, I don't I can't tell you what why they decided to go this way I would have much preferred the other way and um, because that was gross and sticky and um, but I, it feels symbolic because her, when she turns white it's not as aggressive you know I just I feel some it feels symbolic to me that it's an easier transition that way than the other hi good morning how are you Good morning. So it's a pleasure to be speaking with you. My name is Brandon Jones. I'm with LRM Online. Um, my question for you is, so your character was instrumental in working on the Green Book for everyone in this show. And one of the reasons why it resonated with me today was it feels like we almost need one again. Uh, this idea that we're not safe in our homes, we're not safe on the road, we're not safe wherever we go. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, like how that made you feel, um, that having that connection where it just seems like 
Um, not much has changed and there isn't really even a safety net uh, for that now. <sighs> I, I, I'll talk about this on, on in two, two, different, uh, two different ways. Um, one is a very practical, the practical part of that is, is that what what we will need to do as people, as as a people, um, to handle that? I don't know what that's going to look like, and I think what I what I think that I think that um, you know a green book is not going to cut it. You know, I think that these spaces that we presumed to be safe are not safe. You know, I, I, I wouldn't have thought in a million years that George Floyd would have gotten killed in Minneapolis. You know, I don't, I wouldn't have thought that. I would have thought that, yeah, Minneapolis, that's where Prince is from. You know, ain't nothing like that gonna happen in Minneapolis, you know? But now we know that that's, that's not the case. I mean, it's sort of like this notion of what where we thought lynchings happened. And we thought lynchings, we, our perception is that lynchings only happened in the South. But one of the most famous, one of the most famous um, uh, photographs of a lynching actually happened in Kansas. Kerry James Marshall, one of his, uh, one of his, you know, most significant works of art is inspired by that, inspired by that photograph. So there is no place of safety. So there's that. There is no place of safety. How that speaks to Lovecraft and what I love about, what I love, my personal love for this, for this series is that Lovecraft tells us that this idea of time is a fallacy, that there is no past, and that what we think of the future um, will is is only is is corrupted by this idea that we thought something was the past, that in fact we are living the past. In the future, we will we will be living the past, um, and I think that. I think that in terms of a viewer, in terms of someone who was a part of this, I'm excited about that idea. And when I when I say excited, I mean like my cells, my cells come alive with this idea that we have to look at it that, you know, we look at these black and white photos and think we are far from that, but there was blood and skin and bone in those black and white photos. And in fact, we're still living with that blood and skin and bone and injury and, and gunshots, all of that stuff and knees to the neck, all of that stuff did not die. It is something that we live with now and we will continue to live with. So knowing that, what do we do? What do we do in the presence of that knowledge? What do we do? And I think that's what Lovecraft asks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Anjano. And actually, I love your answer to Bernie's question. Because and that's it. So I had a really good time speaking with the cast of Lovecraft Country. I hope you had a good time listening. I'm in the middle of reading the book. I'm not quite going to make it before the show ends, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm still going to finish the book. The show itself is weird and it's kooky and it's fun and it's creepy as hell, especially that last episode with the menstrual show twin. So if you're not watching it, I highly recommend it. Uh, also, special thanks again to the African American Film Critics Association for enabling me to sit on that round table. It was totally fun. But for you, dear listener, if you like what you heard, you know what to do. Do all the socials. Like, rate, comment, subscribe, share. We would definitely appreciate it here at LRM. Also, LRM Online has other great programs for your listening pleasure and other great articles for you to read on the website lrmonline.com. Folks, as always, thanks for listening. We will catch you on the next one. Hasta lasagna.